The evolution versus creation debate continues to be one of those issues that just won't go away. It's taught in our schools and promoted everywhere as the best explanation for how it all began. Atheists proclaim it as the best evidence against God, and sadly, even some Christians are in favor of it, usually in an effort to satisfy the perceived tension between the Bible and modern science. However, evolution is a lie, and I'm not joking. Now, you might be thinking, how can Brian say that with such confidence? If you watch this video to the end, I promise I can give you that same level of confidence. I'm going to give you the, all the tools you need to refute the theory of evolution and defend your faith. So before we kick this thing off, though, this video is really long. So I've broken it down into chapters. If you look at the comments section or the timeline, you can click on the specific chapter you would like to know more about. Now, of course, I want you to watch the whole thing, but I also understand that time is super important. So let's get started. What does your Bible say, if anything, about evolution? Does it make any claims? Now, it might surprise you to know that the Bible takes a strong stance in the favor of creation. It's not mystical either. You don't have to infer anything to the Bible to know where it stands on the subject. The Bible makes its, clay, its case as plain as day. So let's start with this statement. Your Bible clearly teaches that everything was created by God in six literal days, fully formed in the image they are now, and that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. Let's take this statement apart and look at each section, starting with the Bible's claims of God creating everything in six literal days. So this is actually taught on page one of your Bible, specifically in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 31. These verses give the history of creation, and this is where God tells us that he created everything in six literal days. For now, let's take a look at just Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So to me, just a plain reading of this text lends itself to a literal 24-hour period of time. I mean, how could God be any clearer, evening and morning the first day? In Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 31, continue on for the other five days of creation. And they all end the same day, all end the same way. Evening and morning the second day, evening and morning the third day, evening and morning the fourth day, etc., etc. Well, regardless of how it sounds, the critics still object, and the typical objection is that the word day could mean any length of time, a 24-hour period or a million years. And technically that's true. The word can be used to describe a regular day or a million years. But the meaning of the word, like all words, depend on how they're used in context. So if we just read this text again and carefully consider its context, we should all be able to agree on its meaning. So let's read the text again, listen for the context, starting in verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So in its context, with the words evening and morning, it becomes apparent that the usage here means a literal 24-hour period. For example, it's like this. If I said to you that I just finished a six-day trip and I told you that it took me the evening and the morning of the first day to drive from eastern Virginia to western Pennsylvania, you would know that I meant a literal 24-hour period based solely on my usage of the supporting context, and the same applies here in Genesis. So in addition to context, we know the entire Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and if we translate the word day to the original Hebrew word, we get the word yom, Y-O-M. Now the word yom actually appears 2,301 times in the Old Testament, and again, because of its context, we can know exactly what it means every single time. Let's look at another common objection to the meaning of the word day. Now, we've all heard people say, well, the Bible says a day is like a thousand years, so no one can know how long creation really took. Well, the Bible sure does say that, but if you continue reading that portion of scripture, it then goes on to say that a thousand years is like a day, so one just cancels the other out. In fact, that verse in 2 Peter 3.8 doesn't say a day is a thousand years, it says a day is like a thousand years. And since God is outside the boundaries of time, that verse makes perfect sense. So another common rebuttal is folks will say that this portion of the book of Genesis is really just Hebrew poetry. Even guys like Ben Shapiro have said that. Well, years ago, John MacArthur had someone create a computer program that could analyze entire texts of scripture and compare them against the fundamentals of Hebrew poetry. And you guessed it, not one word of Hebrew poetry is to be found in the, in the creation account contained in the Bible. So lastly, to further and strengthen our claim on the word day, it's important to note that every single Hebrew scholar will tell you that the word day used here in this context, means a literal 24-hour period of time and is not an example of Hebrew poetry. So why do people attack this word here and not anywhere else? It's not like this is the only place six days is mentioned in the Bible. It's also quoted in Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. 
In Exodus 31, 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So actually, these attacks aren't just on the word yom or day. In reality, over the last several decades, these attacks have been hyper-focused on the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And the reason is really quite simple, but it starts with the understanding that our fight isn't against flesh and blood, but rather is against powers and principalities. This is a ploy from the devil himself. If he can get rid of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, then the foundation of Christianity comes down. Without Genesis, there's no fall of man, no original sin, man is not a sinner in need of a savior, etc., etc. This is why the devil is at this game. He is strategically moving the minds of confused and oftentimes wicked men to promote evolution and make every attempt to discredit God. We must realize this and make the appropriate preparations now. We must answer the call and defend the accuracy and integrity of God's word, and we will continue to lose many in the battles to come. We must also take note that these men are just men being used by the devil, and that many of us were once like that. And for that reason, we shouldn't just rebuke them. We should also offer them answers in God's plan for salvation. Understanding that they are not the real enemy here is vitally important. Okay, moving on with our initial statement. Your Bible clearly teaches that everything was created by God in six literal days. Check that one off. Fully formed in the image that they are now. So your Bible teaches that when we were created, we were all created in the former image that we are now, meaning we didn't evolve from any lower life forms. And this statement is true for animals as well as us. The Bible makes it clear that when God created Adam, he created him fully human. In short, Adam would have looked just like us today when God created him back then. Minus a belly button, though, if you really think about it. Well, we get there using two verses, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. In Genesis 1.27, we are told, so God created man in his own image. In Colossians 1.15, we are told that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. These verses tell us that Adam was created in God's image, and also that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Since we know what Jesus looked like, we can now safely conclude that Adam looked just like Jesus when he was created. So these two passages form the bridge for us. Your Bible teaches that Adam, Jesus, and all humanity are created in God's image, which means we are all made fully human and didn't evolve from any lower life, life forms or species over time. So to further strengthen the idea that Adam was created in the form we are now, let's take a look at Genesis 2-7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. I love this verse because it's one of the best to use against believers that like to play with the idea that God used evolution to create all living things. These folks are called evolutionary theists. But just looking back at the few verses we've already seen, it's obvious that the Bible doesn't support that idea either. This verse also ensures us that God certainly didn't breathe life into a single cell's nostrils in some primordial soup and call that a man. It's obvious God created a fully formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into him. Finally, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, we're told a few more things that God had in mind for Adam. These verses make it clear that Adam would have had to have been created fully human to be able to react to what God told him. So starting in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, You may eat freely from every tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God also said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make for him a suitable helper. Continuing with verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name each one. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the area with flesh. And from the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman. For out of man she was taken. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So in order for Adam to cultivate the earth and name all the animals, he would have had to have been created fully human. Here we are also told that none of the animals were a suitable helpmate for Adam. Adam, being uniquely different, needed someone else who would also be uniquely different to be his helper. So God created another human to meet that specific purpose. Those scriptures prove that your Bible clearly teaches that Adam was created fully human in the way we are now when God created him. Okay, moving on with our initial statement. Your Bible clearly teaches that everything was created by God in six literal days, fully formed in the image that they are now, and that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Again, your Bible clearly teaches that the earth is only 6,000 years old, 
and the majority of well-respected Bible scholars believe this to be true. So how do these scholars arrive at this conclusion? Well, it's no secret. They get there simply just by reading their Bibles. It works like this. In Genesis, there are very specific genealogies, and when the years listed in the genealogies are added together, they provide a timeline starting from creation. They then move on to known events in ancient history and map those out, and lastly, they employ the genealogies listed in the books of Matthew and Luke in the New Testament, and then they arrive at an age of the earth that is approximately 6,000 years old. The Bible teaches that it's 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus Christ, and then another 2,000 years from Christ to the present. So 6,000 years it is, for real. That's how it's done, simple as that. Plainly revealed in God's word. In fact, when we study the earth's geology, biology, paleontology, and astronomy, it becomes clear that our world is really a lot younger than we have all been taught to believe. There's something else your Bible teaches that contradicts the evolutionary theory of millions of years, and it has everything to do with death. Evolutionists would have you think that the earth saw millions of life forms living and dying for millions of years before the first man showed up. But the Bible teaches that death didn't exist until man sinned. Death is part of the curse that Adam and Eve brought into the world through their sin. Listen to Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So this verse actually teaches that death didn't exist until after man was created, and Adam and Eve committed the first sin. You can't have millions of years of lower life forms living and dying because man didn't sin yet, so death wasn't a reality. See, isn't it cool to know what your Bible says, to know your Bible never affirms evolution, never ever, and actually your Bible contains the real answers to how we got here? Okay, I know that was a lot. We can take a break because that concludes the look at our opening statement that your Bible clearly teaches that everything was created by God in six literal days, fully formed in the image they are now, and that the earth is only 6,000 years old. So if you've ever wondered how in the world a Christian can deny evolution and believe in a young earth, now you know it's because the Bible clearly teaches it. I recommend you spend some more time researching what your Bible says and look for those scriptures that speak of how God created everything. I promise you won't be disappointed. Spend some time with the love letter that God sent to you. All the answers to your questions are in there. Try God on this. I beg you to read it. Hang on every word. Squeeze it. Taste it. Question it. God's big enough. He can handle anyone's criticisms because he's all truth. And not only that, but God isn't playing hide and seek here. He wants you to know the truth. God loves you. As a side note, my favorite scripture on the subject is Psalm 139.14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, it should be obvious by now that your Bible supports a created worldview and slaps down any thought of evolution. But how does the Bible stand up against what we see in our universe? Does anything in our world support the Bible's claims? I mean, shouldn't our world, if it were indeed created by God, show evidence that supports the Bible? As a matter of fact, the evidence of what we see in nature is overwhelmingly in favor of a created worldview and in direct opposition to an evolutionary worldview. First off, the universe and everything in it appears to have been designed. Everywhere we look, we see the design in nature and in all living things. One of the best places to see this design would be to look no further than our own DNA. When scientists Watson and Crick first discovered and mapped out DNA, it brought to light the fact that DNA is the information for all living things. In fact, the DNA in your body is actually digital code. This code provides the required instructions for your hair color, hereditary features, height, skin tone, eye color, etc. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, is quoted as describing our DNA like this, and I quote, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created, end quote. Atheist Richard Dawkins is quoted as saying, the machine code of the gene is uncanny computer-like. He also stated that some species of the unjustly called primitive amoebas have as much information in their DNA as 1,000 Encyclopedia Britannicas. So DNA is essentially our internal operating system. And for any operating system to work, it must be aligned and written in a very precise arrangement. If it's not, you don't exist. Simply put, DNA provides digital information to all living things, and this information, like all information, is given to the end user by an intelligence. No digital code exists by accident. Let's go back to, and look at Bill Gates' quote. DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Who wrote our computer program? Someone had to arrange all this code in a very specific sequence for life to exist. But the evolutionist wants us to believe it's here by chance. So keep that thought and then think of any other far less advanced code. Say like your ABCs written on the pages of a book. Can you imagine that code just showing up one day and forming words all by itself? I don't care how much time you have, there is simply no way for that to happen. Another example of this design is the nanotechnology living within your cells. The biology in your cells is chock full of super advanced nanotech. There are cells that look like men carrying heavy objects overhead. There are machines that have propellers. 
and there are cells that look like little trucks ferrying proteins from one part of the body to another. One of the coolest examples of this nanotech is called the bacteria flagellum. The bacteria flagellum is a rotary nanomachine that lives inside some of the cells in your body, and its main function is to provide propulsion for certain bacterial species. It has a propeller and an electric motor. The motor has a universal joint, bushings, bearings, a rotor, a stator, and even a reduction gear. The rotor alone operates at anywhere from 6 to 17,000 RPM. Using its reduction gear, it can gear down the attached filament to operate anywhere between 200 and 1,000 RPM. It has no on or off switch, but gets its operating information from the body by being sensitive to chemicals and temperatures outside of itself. The existence of such a machine blew me away when I saw it. You should Google it. How this could have evolved in a gradual step-by-step -step process, as required by a classical Darwinian evolution, is an insurmountable obstacle to evolutionists, and quite frankly has been rendered to be impossible. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, scientist Michael Behe points out the fact that the bacteria flagellum is an example of irreducible complexity, meaning that it couldn't have evolved because no less complex system would be able to function without all the parts and pieces found to already exist in the machine. A couple more examples of intelligent design in our world would be that our world is fine-tuned to support life on this planet. The very law of mathematics and physics seem to be tweaked just right to support life on the planet Earth, and any minor shift in these laws would render this planet uninhabitable. That fine-tuning carries over to the harmony of life. The harmony of life between everything in our universe to work within and amongst itself is nothing short of amazing. This harmony gives off a strong impression that all creation is made to live in harmony, and without this harmony nothing would be able to exist. Simply put, there are too many things that rely on too many things to exist. In short, nothing in nature can exist in isolation. Your Bible, DNA, nanotech, the fine-tuning of the universe, and the harmony of life are all in agreement that our world is young and has been designed and created by an intelligence that is far, far superior to ours. When famous atheists and evolutionary scientists Lawrence Krauss and Richard Dawkins were asked about the overwhelming appearance of design in nature, this is what they had to say. Krauss is quoted as saying, The illusion of purpose and design is perhaps the most pervasive illusion about nature that science has to confront on a daily basis. And Dawkins said something similar when he stated, Biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. So these men agree that the universe looks designed, but they call the look an illusion. So look at your phone or your computer. These items have obviously been designed. Now consider the human eye. It's way more complicated than your phone or your computer. Yet we're supposed to believe its purpose and design are just illusions and are, is only here by random chance and genetic mutation. Okay, this brings us to the next section of this video. Let's now take a closer look at the claims of evolution. Darwinian evolution is defined as descent with modification. It's the idea that species change over time, give rise to new species, and share a common ancestor. It's a theory that all animals evolve through variation and natural selection to those most fit to survive in particular environments. In short, it's the survival of the fittest. And given enough time, those species will gradually evolve into being more suitable for their environment. The most current timeline plays out like this. About four and a half billion years ago, the chemical environment on Earth was just right for life to develop. At that same time, either lightning or some other means blasted the initial environment. The so-called primordial soup and the first cell was generated. This cell, over vast amounts of time, gradually evolved into more and more advanced life forms. So from that first cell, we get bacteria, then we get more advanced organic compounds, then DNA, then proteins. Funny enough, though, you can't have proteins without DNA, and you can't have DNA without proteins. Yet another hurdle, but I digress. After DNA, you start to get animals and plants, and then lesser species, species evolving into more advanced species, like the dog or the whale or the monkey or the man, or vice versa. And as time marches on, evolution continues to produce more and more complex organisms. Okay, that's Darwinian evolution. So let's start off with the gross assumption that all animals evolve from lesser species. This assumption presents the evolutionists with some serious problems. The biggest problem lies within the fossil record. Yeah, you might not know this, but the fossil record in the world is huge. In fact, to date, we have found trillions of them. With so many fossils laying around, the fossil record should support the theory of evolution. In short, we should be able to easily see where one animal evolved into another just by looking at the fossil record. These types of fossils would be called transitional fossils. However, despite trillions of fossils, no transitional fossils have ever been found to exist. No kidding, not one. Not one transitional fossil has ever been found that would support the theory of evolution. And guess what? Evolutionists know it. Darwin certainly knew it. In his book, Origin of Species, Darwin is quoted as saying, since innumerable transitional forms must have existed, why did we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? 
Why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? This perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Origin of Species, page 293. So sadly for Darwin, not much has changed since then. Stephen Jay Gould is quoted as saying, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. He goes on to say that we fancy ourselves as the only true students of life's history, yet to pres preserve our favorite account of evolution by natural selection, we view our data as so bad that we never see the very process we profess to study. End quote. <laughs> Again, zero evidence from the fossil record. Now let me just add that sometimes scientists will claim that transitional fossils have been found. They'll usually use examples like the Archaeopteryx dinosaur or some other fossil. However, believe me when I tell you that every example they can give is easily refuted with a simple Google search. Whenever you hear someone say things like this, Google sites like Creation Answers or Answers in Genesis, they more than set you straight. Do we see evidence of evolution today? No, we don't. We see adaptation, but that's not evolution. Adaptation is defined as a change or the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. Ray Comfort from Living Waters Ministries produced a film titled Evolution vs. God. I highly recommend you watch it. It's free on YouTube. In it, he asks a UCLA professor and a USC professor for evidence of evolution, and they point to Darwin's finches and Lenski's bacteria as proof. They're quoted as saying that the finches' beaks on the Galapagos Islands are bigger than other finches because they have been evolving to their environment. They also point to Lesky's bacteria stating that the bacteria are producing additional bacteria to evolve to their environment. However, at the end of the day, Darwin's finches are still finches, and Lesky's bacteria are still bacteria. They aren't evolving, they're adapting to their environment. All living things have the ability to, ability to adapt to their environment. The blueprint to do this is already contained within their own DNA, but they will never evolve into a different kind of creature. This process of one species evolving into another has never been witnessed. Again, another huge assumption based on misinterpreting the facts. And it might surprise you to know that the Bible actually has something specific to say in regards to the separation of plants and animals into their distinct species. In Genesis chapter 1, again Genesis, God is quoted as saying, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The word kind here refers to the kind of animal. The Bible's first use of this word is found in Genesis 1 when God created plants and animals according to their kinds. It's used again in Genesis 6 and 8 when God instructs Noah to take every two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal into the ark, and again in God's command to the animals to reproduce after the flood. A plain reading of the text, in context, infers that plants and animals were created to reproduce within the boundaries of their kind, and it's exactly what we see play out today. For example, if we look at the wolf, the coyote, or the corgi, all of these animals belong to the Canidae family and are all classified as dogs. They are all in the dog kind of classification. And no matter what your dog looks like, they are all related to a common ancestor. So what we see in the world today are kinds producing offspring after their same kinds, but not evolving to other different kinds. In the case of the wolf, the coyote, and the corgi, we see adaptation and variation, but that's not evolution. Just look at the way we've used the dog's ability to adapt to our advantage. Over the years, we've bred dogs to get the right kind of dog for the right kind of job. We have little herding dogs like corgis. We have big guard dogs that are great at protecting. We have hunting dogs like the German Shorthair that are great at hunting, etc., etc. All these different types of dogs are in the end still just dogs and all part of the Canada family. And all of the genetic information to allow for this variety was and is already contained in the dog's DNA. We have just exploited it for our, for our own purposes. It's also interesting to note that the current system of animal classification is based on the pioneering work of the creation scientist Carolus Linnaeus. He taught that animals are all derived from original kinds and were all part of God's original plan because God placed the potential for variation in the original creation. So we do see man breeding buffalo with cows, and that works because they're the same kind, but we don't see cows and giraffes, nor do we see chimps and humans being able to crossbreed. It doesn't work like that. It can't. You can't match the wrong kinds together and produce anything. The DNA living inside each thing is specific to its kind and won't allow for it, period. So adaptation is certainly possible in animals, and we see that every day, but it certainly doesn't stop there. This ability to adapt is also found in us as well. Consider all the different people groups in the world. A closer look at these people groups, and it's obvious that they've all adapted to their environments. Just think of the difference of people that live on the equator versus those that live close to the poles. To better understand human adaptation, there are two ecological rules that guide us. These are known as Bergman's Rule and Allen's Rule. Now, this is pretty heavy stuff here, so let me try to get through it without gaffing it up. But 
These rules help to explain the variation in size and shape of human bodies and extremities using latitude and temperature. Now listen close to what I'm going to tell you and think of an Eskimo. Bergman's rule is that warm-blooded creatures, that's us, tend to have increasing body size with increasing latitude and decreasing average temperatures. So humans that live closer to the poles tend to have a larger body size. Allen's rule is a corollary of Bergman's rule that applies to appendages. Warm-blooded creatures tend to have shorter limbs with increasing latitude and decreasing average temperatures. So again, humans that live closer to the poles tend to have shorter limbs as well. We know that when organisms are more compact, they tend to conserve more heat due to a high mass-to-surface area ratio. When organisms are more linear, they tend to lose more heat due to a low mass-to-surface area ratio. So I apologize for the science lesson here, but in summary, the idea is that people groups toward the poles tend to be shorter, have a thicker body size, and have shorter limbs than do people on the equator. Remember our Eskimo? He tends to be shorter and heavier than the people we would find that live close to the equator. So in short, all the differences we see in the many people groups around the world can all be attributed to adaptation. Okay, moving on. Let's now take a look at the evolutionary methods used to date things on our planet. It's widely known by both sides of the scientific community that using modern evolutionary dating methods can often give very incorrect results. Consider the following examples. If you killed a seal in the Baltic Sea today and dated it using today's dating methods, the seal would be well over 3,500 years old. And no, seals don't live quite that long. The rocks that formed after the Mount St. Helens eruption just over 40 years ago when dated using today's dating methods have been shown to be thousands to millions of years old, yet we know they are only a bit over 40 years old. Archaeologists have discovered that some mummies in Egypt were buried with birds. When we date them using modern dating methods, the mummy and the birds are not only sometimes millions of years old, but the bird is sometimes thousands of years older or younger than the mummy, yet they were buried together. These are just a few of the many examples that bring to question today's dating methods. Evolutionary scientists employ a vast array of dating methods, and if you can believe it, all of these methods are based on assumptions. The big issue with dating methods is that they can be grossly contaminated due to severe geological events like earthquakes, volcanoes, and global flooding. This is a problem because these dating methods have to rely on a uniform aging of our planet. What I mean by that is that it's almost any catastrophic event will contaminate the test subject. That's why volcanoes and floods prevent huge issues when it comes to dating things. These events skew the data. When it comes to carbon dating, scientists have to assume that the subject hasn't inadvertently received more carbon than what's expected, like in our example where the freshly killed seal is thousands of years old. We know his age is skewed primarily by what he eats. He eats additional carbon from mollusks and shells and they add to his carbon totals, making him appear to be much older than he actually is. Similar issues exist when it comes to radiometric dating. In order for this method to work, the scientist has to assume that the rate in which the Earth and animals have received radiation has been the same throughout time, but it's impossible for anyone to know that, especially given the violent past of our universe with solar flares and exploding stars bombarding the Earth with way more radiation that could be considered a constant rate. Evolutionary scientists know all this, so they have to, they have to use many additional techniques to aid in their assumptions. One additional technique they use for dating this planet is to use tree rings. In the Canham bill nye debate, Bill Nye brought up an example of a tree that had over 6,000 tree rings in it, thus essentially invalidating Ken Ham's claims that the Earth was only 6,000 years old. But we know that, that tree rings don't equate to years in all cases. Some rings equate to less years and some to more years. In the example Bill Nye gave, the bristlecone tree is subject to producing more tree rings in a year during times of drought. However, apart from all of that, when it comes to the age of the Earth, it's important to consider this factor. When God created everything, he gave it the appearance of age. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when God created Adam, it's safe to assume, just by reading the text, that he didn't make him a baby. It's safe to assume that he was created as a mature man. The same would go for the trees and the animals. A 40-foot oak tree created on day three might have 400 rings in it, but it was just created that day. In essence, God also invalidated the dating methods. Some folks say, well, the speed of light debunks the creation account because we know exactly what the speed of light is. So if a star out in the galaxy is a million light years away, it would take a million years for us to see the light from it. So that proves the universe is millions of years old. Well, how about this for a wild solution? God not only created the stars in one day, but he also created the light in between there and here in one day. Does that sound impossible? We understand from the Bible that the creation of the universe, and this includes the stars, was a supernatural event with which God accomplished by the power of a spoken word. All right, but if that's too simplistic, let me give you another idea. This, one, this one's going to blow your mind. Research has been done on the speed of light. It's a proven fact that the speed of light has decayed over time. 
Barry Satterfield, an Australian scientist, proposed this decay in the speed of light in his writings called The Velocity of Light and the Age of the Universe. Satterfield charted a decay rate for the speed of light, which would place the actual age of the Earth to be less than 6,000 years old. And not only that, but amazingly enough, scientists have also recently determined that they can slow down the speed of light and almost bring it to a complete stop. If man can do this, then so can God. Another hit against the old age Earth construct came in 2005 when Mary Schweitzer, a molecular paleontologist at NC State University, discovered soft tissue in dinosaur bones. No kidding. This is real tissue from the dinosaur. It had collagen, amino, re- amino acids, and red blood cells. And this was no rare case either. Since her initial discovery, it's now a common occurrence to find soft tissue in dinosaur bones. As you can imagine, soft tissue usually breaks down pretty quickly, but the tissue's cellular structure was found still intact. How is this possible? Well, the only way to get there is that a plant or animal has to die in a watery environment and be buried quickly in mud and silt. The best way to produce this situation would be during a flood. When flood waters recede, we get plants and animals being buried quickly under mud and silt. Does that sound like a familiar event to you? It does to me, just like Noah's flood, described in your Bible. This alone makes it obvious that the dinosaur couldn't be as old as we originally thought or as old as we were all taught. Lastly, and it's of note, many creation scientists have requested to have these tissues radioisotope dated, but all requests have been denied. This, this information should change the way we think about the age of the Earth. In reality, time is not a magic wand. No amount of time will produce evolutionary results, and that's a fact. What if I said to you that the pyramids were produced by severe windstorms over millions of years? No amount of time would allow that to happen. Besides, we know it was the aliens anyway, but that's another show. So the salinity of the oceans also contradicts the age of the Earth. The oceans get their salinity by runoff from lakes, streams, and rivers, and scientists are able to calculate the total amount of the total annual increase in salinity due to this runoff. The current salinity of the ocean is in line with an Earth that is less than 10,000 years old. However, if we believe the evolutionist and the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, then every sea would be a dead sea. The salinity of the oceans would be way too high for any life to survive. If the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, then we have another issue world population. Dr. Henry Morse, the father of biblical creationism, wrote several articles on the topic of world population and Bible chronology. With painstaking detail in the aid of mathematical equations, he shows how the world's population is an indication of the age of the earth. Dr. Morse shows that an extremely conservative average population growth of 1% per year, which is a fourth of our present rate, would add up to the present population of the earth in only 4,000 years. And according to Bible chronology, that's right because 4,000 years ago was the flood when the total population of the earth was wiped out and man had to start over again with just eight people. Dr. Morris goes on to say it begins to be glaringly evident that the human race cannot be very old. The traditional biblical chronology is infinitely more realistic than the millions of years of history of mankind assumed by the evolutionists. He says if they were right and there were millions of years, the population of the earth now would be 10 to the 5,000th power. If we eventually were able to colonize all other worlds in the universe and build space cities everywhere in the interstellar spaces, it can be shown that a maximum of no more than 10 to the 100th power of people could be crammed into the entire known universe. I know that was a bit heavy, but in short, our universe, let alone our planet, is unable to hold all the people that would exist if humans have existed for millions of years. Even if you allow for huge human death tolls from war, disease, and severe weather events, the number is still just impossible. The population argument is just another strike against the old Earth argument. Even more evidence exists for a young Earth when we study the landscape of our planet. The mountains and canyons better resemble a young Earth than what we would see after a catastrophic global event like the Flood. Now you may be thinking that the Grand Canyon has to be millions of years old. However, there is overwhelming proof that when a catastrophic event takes place, these canyons can be formed a lot quicker than we thought. The best example of of this is the canyon that now exists as a result of the Mount St. Helens volcanic eruption. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, it created a little Grand Canyon that is over 100 feet deep in just six hours. It also created many crevices over 150 feet deep, all in a matter of a day. Now imagine what a year's worth of the Noah's floodwaters draining away from the face of the earth could do. See, our world actually lines up more with what the Bible says about where we came from than what man says. Ever heard of the Cambrian explosion? Consider again the words of God in Genesis and that he created everything in six literal days. The Cambrian explosion is defined as an early period of time when all major life forms abruptly appeared on the earth. It's like one day there was nothing, and the next day there was everything. Just as you would imagine when God said he created everything almost instantaneously in six literal days. All scientists know that the Cambrian explosion is a fact. No one on either side disputes it. It clearly matches that the Bible's account that everything was made instantaneously. 
The Cambrian explosion alone contradicts the idea that life appeared slowly over vast amounts of time. Professor Louis Barone, former president of the Biological Society of Strasbourg and director of the Strasbourg Zoological Museum, stated, Evolutionism is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Dr. T. N. Tamishan from the Atomic Energy Commission stated, Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact are great con men, and the story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In the Ben Stein movie Expelled, atheist Richard Dawkins was asked, what do you think is the possibility that intelligent design might turn out to be the answer? He stated, and I quote, well, it could come about in the following way. It could be that at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded into perhaps this planet. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of a designer. End quote. Dawkins just said that a higher life form, an alien life form, could be the reason for life on our planet. Yet he is a devout atheist and a devout evolutionist. Per his own admission, the world can only come about by strict natural processes. He even directs his followers to belittle anyone that believes in a creator. But here he is claiming that God cannot be behind our planet, but aliens can. That proves it to me that evolution science is more about a worldview and an effort to remove God altogether than it is about true science. It's also important to note that he uses terms such as could, per, probably, perhaps, and might. Speakers who use terms like this don't know if the claims they are making are true. They aren't certain. His argument is not supported by a strong foundation. Rather, he is making the statement based upon his worldview and not on facts. In short, he is grasping at straws, and again we are back to huge assumptions. I'm always amazed when people believe in something like evolution. They seem to swallow the whole story in the absence of facts, like some of the friends that I have that believe in Bigfoot or aliens without a shred of evidence. It all comes down to them wanting to believe it. Like Dawkins, he wants to believe we either came from nothing or an alien created us. But yet when presented with the overwhelming evidence of evidences for the existence of God, he won't believe it. Sadly, it seems there will never be enough evidence for some people to believe in God. You know, I had a friend of mine once say to me, then why do so many scientists go along with it if it's just a lie? Now, this actually got me. I may have even flinched a little. <laughs> it's true, though. The vast majority of scientists are all considered evolutionary scientists. But when I researched this a bit closer, what I found was really disturbing. There are literally thousands of cases where a scientist will openly question evolution and then be fired or moved to a different university and really just canceled altogether. The grant money will dry up and many will lose their jobs. So the threat of this happening at all is the real reason that the vast majority are labeled as evolutionary scientists. Not because they believe it, but to speak out against the establishment could cost them everything. Again, check out the Ben Stein movie Expelled. It covers this exact thing in great detail. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube. And this is really sad on another level because science is all about questioning things, but not anymore. Well, luckily for me, I've been canceled like a million times, so I'm speaking out, you know. So is any science any good? Absolutely, but there are actually two types. One is based on facts and one is based on assumptions. Remember the hypothesis from grade school? But the hypothesis is garbage if it can't be tested and proved true. No doubt science has given us many great things, but true science follows the scientific method. The scientific method is defined as observation, experimentation, and verification. In today's science, the theory of evolution and its claims are not, not observable. No experience has ever been shown to prove evolution true, and it's not verifiable. In 1 Timothy 6.20, Paul states, Timothy, protect what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge or science. That's important for us to remember today as well. Science is ever-changing, but God's world never changes. He can be trusted, despite what the world says. In closing, evolution is not based on facts, but rather on imaginary assumptions. And nothing works like that. Shame on us for thinking so. Can you imagine medicine or mathematics being based on those assumptions? How about the laws of physics? Let me say as we get ready to close that I could have cited many more proofs to discredit evolution. We could have talked about the supposed missing links, such as pre-homo sapien hominoids like Lucy or the, or the Neanderthal man, and easily debunked those. We could have gone into greater detail on all the sciences, but I would have never gotten this video finished. I really just wanted to hit the high points in hopes that it will whet your appetite to do some research on your own. We truly have every resource at our fingertips. I would recommend you take some time on Google sites like Answers in Genesis, Creation Answers, Illustria Media, The Discovery Institute, Living Waters, Got Questions. Also, Google solid Bible teachers like John MacArthur, Paul Washer, Vody Bauckham, R.C. Sproul, and Steve Lawson. Be sure to read your Bible daily. Many books inform, but only one book transforms. I would also recommend that when you hear today's science being propagated, that you just go to those sites I mentioned and do some research. 
There are many reasons that people peddle evolution, but the Bible presents the best reason. In John 3.19, we are told, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Unconverted men will always strive to create a worldview that excludes God, but we must stand up to them. We must be learned men. We can't afford to have these men teach our children and our children's children. Precious lives are at stake. Thanks for watching. See you next time.